Lord of Mysteries Chapter 725 Morning Upon seeing the messenger disappear, Klein thought of the demigods he could contact on short notice, but he realized that there weren't any. All he could do was turn his attention on to what he should do next. The city-wide broadcast must have made Sea King John Cotman not only find Helmasuan, but he would also do his best to search for Sea God and the traces of his believers. It's easy to be detected if I leave in the middle of the night, so I can only choose to stay here until daybreak. I can't take that ship tomorrow. If I encounter an attack midway, I might affect everyone on the ship. Furthermore, it's not discreet enough. Hem, I can summon an undersea creature and leave by riding it. I can rest and switch rides on the deserted islands and reefs we encounter along the way until I arrive at the next port. Since Orange Light said that the unique trait can only be detected at close distances, it still won't exceed the size of a city. Even if the Mother Tree of Desire tries to expand her perception range to find me via a ritual or her believers, it might even be limited to the size of a particular street. This is also why I encountered a trap when I arrived in Orebi. As long as I leave Bam, I should be able to escape from their gaze. While Klein's thoughts gradually turned clear, he suddenly heard a signal from the radio transceiver. He hurriedly went over and quickly jotted it down. Then, with the codebook, he transcribed the corresponding words into a single sentence. Before long, the telegram's content appeared on paper in jet black. I see you. I see you. When Klein read those words, he felt a chill run through his heart. Bam. In an ordinary residence not far from the governor general's office. In a spacious basement, there were candles silently burning, scattering their dim glow around the surroundings. Silver coin viper odor had already taken off his hooded robe. He looked at the middle-aged man opposite him as he trembled. He said with a quivering voice, Lord Senner, I don't know know how Helmasuan's real hiding place was known by others as well. Senner wore an old triangular hat. His eye sockets were recessed, and his face was shockingly pale. He looked more like an evil spirit than a human. He raised his hand to stroke the two black mustaches above his lips as his light brown eyes coldly swept across Oder's face. In response, the well-known adventurer couldn't help but lower his head. After observing him for a few seconds, Admiral of Blood, in his white trousers and red coat, said with a deep voice, less than three minutes after that telegram was sent, it was spread across the entire city. And the message spread was part of the telegram. I suspect that another faction has begun paying notice to radio transmissions, and they had obtained our codebook from Old Quinn. Yes, yes, it has to be the case, Odor hurriedly echoed, hoping that Admiral of Blood wouldn't pin the loss of Helmasuin as him being inept. He knew very well that this pirate admiral was cruel to subordinates who made mistakes. Senner swept his gaze at Odor and sneered. Regardless, you failed. If not for you and your mistress giving me plenty of joy, I would have gotten you to dig out your intestines. Send a telegram. Tell that listener who might or might not exist that I can see him. Let him spend the night in horror and unease. This is the only thing you need to do now. Upon hearing that, Odor immediately heaved a sigh of relief. He glanced at Admiral of Blood in trepidation in the bloody altar behind him before reverently replying, Yes, Lord Senner. He felt that he would have become part of the sacrificial items just moments ago. After Odor retreated out of the basement, Senner turned his head to look at the altar covered with human heads, organs, limbs, and blood. He said in a manner even more reverent than how Odor treated him, Lord Shanks, has the ritual succeeded? Yes, all that's left is to wait for God to respond. A cold, unfeeling voice sounded from the drooping curtains around the altar. Then, the curtains seemed to possess life as they rolled up on both sides, smoothly forming a knot before landing in the middle of the altar. A somewhat translucent figure appeared by the side of the altar at some point in time. His skin was slightly brown, and his wrinkles formed deep crevices. His white, thinned hair was like leaves in autumn, as though they had lived for many, many years. He humbly fixated his gaze at the candlelight with his brown eyes. Senner didn't dare say a word as he stood beside Lord Shanks, awaiting for any changes to happen to the altar. Suddenly, the candle's flame was dyed with all kinds of colors. Each color seemed to correspond to the different desires of an observer. The heads, organs, limbs, and blood on the altar moved by themselves as they stacked up together, forming the state of a melted candle. Before long, they formed a tree of flesh and blood that wasn't too tall. Its surface was uneven, resembling the shell of a walnut. Plop, plop, plop. The interior of the tree of flesh and blood seemed to have a heart beating forcefully with strength. When Senner was about to succumb to the din, the tree of flesh and blood instantly withered, rotting into slosh and collapsing. There was a tiny, flesh-colored, moist, sticky ball left behind. 
Soon, the tiny ball grew four limbs and a head, turning into a palm-sized humanoid creature. Its face didn't have any eyes, nose, or ears other than a pinhole-like mouth. In its mouth, grayish-white fog spewed out before converging back in. It repeated several times without stopping. The elder named Shanks devoutly and passionately chanted the name Mother Tree of Desire and reached out to grab the strange tiny figure. Silently, all the candle lights were extinguished, but to a wraith who had night vision, this didn't affect them from seeing things. Senna observed Shanks and heard this important person say in a deep voice, We've prepared for a long time for this ritual, and God's grace can help us sense the existence of the target through a wider range. Next, we can use the glasses made by the Life School of Thought to accurately locate him. As he spoke, Shanks took out a monocle from his inner pocket. It didn't look any different from a normal monocle, but it coruscated with a pearly white luster in the darkness. Lord Shanks, what should we do next? Senner asked respectfully. The wrinkled Shanks thought for a few seconds and said, Seek out the target after daybreak. If he has powerful helpers, we will monitor him and prevent him from leaving our detection range. Then, patiently await Lord Sua's arrival. If he doesn't have any guardians and is weak himself, then we shall take action directly. After hearing the word Sua, the corners of Senner's forehead twitched as though just the mere mention of this important figure's left him apprehensive. He slowly took a deep breath and said, Yes, Lord Shanks. After answering, Senner instinctively touched the necklace by his chest. The necklace seemed to be made of pure silver, and the pendant looked like an ancient coin. The Klein, who didn't get much sleep for the rest of the night due to the fright from receiving the telegram, immediately sacrificed his suitcase, wallet, and most of his cash to the mysterious space above the gray fog at daybreak. After clearing up his tracks, he went to the front desk to check out. He rode a carriage to the borders of Bayam, left the city, and climbed the mountain as though he was heading for a cemetery prepared for locals. Midway through his journey, he suddenly took a detour into the woods and planned on walking straight to the cliffs where a massive undersea creature was waiting underneath for him. The birds chirped and the insects buzzed in the woods as critters would occasionally scuttle by. Klein walked through the humic material covered grounds at high speed. Along the way, he saw mushrooms growing after the rain, torn cloth, and rubbish which the Bayam residences had left behind after a picnic. Everything seemed so serene alongside the fresh morning air. A leaf fluttered down as Klein didn't stop and easily dodged it. At that moment, the leaf's speed sped up and did a surprising bend, clinging to him in between his lips and nose. It was like an adult's palm that clasped his mouth and nose tightly, making it impossible for him to breathe. Sue, Sue, Sue. The surrounding trees had their branches fall off as they shot at Klein like sharp arrows, and the rubbish left from the picnic received a life of their own. They formed an airtight net as they came looming over. Chapter 726 Preparations are very important. Suddenly, Klein had a familiar feeling. It felt like every tree, every leaf, every rock, every blade of grass wanted him dead. Upon seeing the rubbish comprising of fragments and paper lunge at him in a strange web, his body suddenly collapsed into a paper figurine. Sue, Sue, Sue. The arrow-like branches impaled the paper figurines and landed into the distance. As for the strange net, it immediately enveloped everything within into a ball as it gently squirmed. Klein's body appeared to the side about eight meters away. He knew that the attack he was worried about had finally descended upon him. He didn't make any observations or show any hesitation. Raising his right palm, he reached into his pocket and pulled out the adventurer's harmonica. The situation he had encountered had made him realize that the attacker was likely a demigod from the Rose School of Thought. It was an enemy he was currently unable to defend against. The one who had been pursuing Sharon back then gave him a similar feeling. At this moment, the paper figurines in his pocket suddenly flew out as they plastered over his face, one after another, layer after layer. At the same time, Klein's sleeves automatically tightened as they bound both his arms, preventing his palms from reaching down. His Taraba shirt and brown jacket were tightening like a bear giving him a hug. In seconds, he was bound on the spot by his clothes, trousers, and shoes. His face was covered with paper figurines as his ribs were on the brink of fracturing. He found it abnormally difficult to breathe. Klein was mentally prepared and was equipped with rich combat experience, so he didn't panic. His right thumb and middle finger, which weren't affected, touched each other as he snapped his fingers. At his ham, scarlet flames immediately soared up, burning the tightly bound trousers clean before spreading upwards and downwards. Seizing this opportunity, Klein bent his knees and jumped up with great difficulty, like a cannonball that weakly fell to the ground moments after being launched, as he lunged to his right. In midair, he snapped his fingers again. This time, the sleeve by the right arm joint was ignited. As for the spot where he was originally standing, 
the green weeds suddenly withered as the blackened ground suddenly turned white as if it had been weathered by the elements. This attack was silent and deadly, without any forewarning. Klein knew that his enemy was powerful, and that staying in the same spot would likely result in him suffering an attack he couldn't resist. Therefore, he first removed the influence on his legs. If he hadn't done so, he would have already been heavily injured and lose his ability to do combat. He might have even perished. With a smacking sound, two spots around Klein's sleeves ignited. His right palm finally had the freedom to move as he reached into his pocket and grabbed the adventurer's harmonica. Flop! He fell to the ground, rolling as he immediately stopped himself with his right hand to bounce up. His left palm which wore a human skin glove snapped its fingers. This time, his target was the paper figurines that were plastered over his face to prevent him from breathing. Pa, the paper figurines burned up as the scarlet tongues of fire burned Klein's hair. At that moment, a scene suddenly flashed in his mind. An icicle had formed and was speeding right for his head like a thin gloomy green arrow. Due to its speed, it was translucent itself, making it usually impossible to discover it. But even though Klein's danger premonition was triggered, it was a little too late. This was because his clothes were still affecting his mobility. It was too late for him to dodge the attack. A thought flashed through his mind as he barely bent his back. His upper torso was bent backward and he moved quite significantly to his right. Oof. The thin, cold ice arrow struck his left chest, instantly shattering the brown jacket and white round collar shirt which were located there as they scattered into the air. However, this lethal ice arrow didn't continue heading forward. This was because in its way was a book with a dark brown cover. The book appeared ordinary, and it was bound into a book with commonly seen yellowish-brown goatskin, but it didn't shatter like the two pieces of clothing. There wasn't even a hole pricked open. Brussels Travels This was an item that even the Sea God Scepter's lightning storm imbued with some powers of the mysterious space had failed to damage. Last night, the telegram of ICU gave Klein such a fright that he undoubtedly reinforced his protective countermeasures. He prepared every method he could think of, apart from hiding the book at his vital spot. His other pocket had the iron cigar case which stored the influence of the corrupted true creator. Once things went bad, he would dispel the wall of spirituality, throw out the item, and see if it would draw the attention of the true creator. He hoped that he would send his powerful subordinates to make the situation more chaotic. He knew that even evil gods like the true creator hated the mother tree of desire. After withstanding the ice arrow, Klein fell to the ground while somersaulting to the side. He then brought the adventurer's harmonica to his lips and blew hard into it. At that moment, his face was turning a little black due to the burning of the paper figurines, but due to flame controlling, he wasn't injured. Then, he felt that the clothes on his left arm, waist, thighs, neck, and legs were restored to normal, giving him newfound freedom. At the moment he blew the harmonica, he quickly activated his spirit vision. He saw Miss Messenger walk out of the void with four blonde, red-eyed heads in hand. They automatically turned and stared at the same spot. One of the heads grunted as it opened its mouth and began drawing in air. A cold wind hummed as a figure was forcibly pulled out from a green tree a hundred meters away from Klein. This figure failed to maintain his difficult-to-detect state as he rapidly turned half-transparent and half-corporeal. He was the wrinkled elder with white, thin hair. His facial features had the traits of the people of the southern continent. Just as his brown eyes reflected Rionet Tynecare, his brows pricked up. Then, he didn't hesitate to open his mouth as though he was about to deliver an extreme curse that he had been preparing for a long time. At this moment, another one of the heads which Rionette Tynecare was holding had opened its mouth as well, as though it was making a silent screech. With that, nothing happened inside the forest. When Shank saw this, he hurriedly turned his head to look at Klein who had yet to react in time when a figure with white, thin hair, and exaggerated wrinkles appeared in his eyes. His mind instantly turned cold. Although his thoughts weren't impeded, he had lost control over his body. All he could do was watch the white-haired elder vanish as he turned to face Miss Messenger. The two heads which Rionette Tynecare carried suddenly flew out and appeared before Klein. One of them opened its mouth as it drew in air, while the other's red eyes turned dark as its teeth turned long and sharp, phasing between an incorporeal and corporeal state. Klein saw the translucent elder with white, Thin hair being forcefully pulled out from his body before Miss Messenger's head with the long teeth that bit at his shoulder, tearing out an object that appeared both like a spirit body and a physical body. Shanks frowned without screaming, 
its figure abruptly vanished as it leaped to a spot with a glass fragment a hundred meters away. Following that, he seemed to be pursued by formless hands and enemies. He kept phasing into shallow puddles of water, the eyes of animals, the dew on plants, etc. Finally, he was able to catch a breather, and still, Klein was feeling a little stiff and cold from the inside out. Phew. Shanks entered the spirit world and walked out again. In his hand was a moist, sticky, palm-sized doll. This figure's face only had a hole as it was inhaling and exhaling a grayish-white fog which Klein found familiar. Shanks didn't hesitate as he stuffed the doll into his mouth. Upon seeing this, Rionette Tynecare's other two heads left her palm, and like before, flew towards Shanks at a fast speed, arriving nearly instantly. However, Shanks had already begun transforming. His body turned black as his skin scrunched up and water began seeping out. His hair, brows, and other parts began withering and dropping. Following that, his limbs grew long and thin. In just a second, Shanks seemed to be assimilated by the doll, becoming a huge, black, moist infant with long forelimbs and swollen shriveled skin. His eyes, nose, mouth, and ears moved from their original locations to the middle of his face as though they were gathering together to form a brand new organ. His skin, limbs, and newly formed organ brought an indescribable sense of mystery and wickedness. Just a single look had made his body which had just recovered from the coldness feel extremely itchy. Red spots protruded from his skin as a result of the clumps of fine granules. His eyes undoubtedly suffered a piercing pain. He instinctively closed them tight as tears were forced out. By the time he calmed himself with cogitation and opened his eyes again, he realized that Miss Messenger and the Rose School of Thought's demigod had vanished. However, Klein's spiritual intuition told him that they were nearby. They were in an intense battle shuttling between the real world and the spirit world. Be it the dropping of the leaves, the shaking of the weeds, the crawling of the worms, and the fleeing of the wild beasts, all of them represented each and every clash. As his mind whirred, Klein took out Death Knell and tapped his left thumb on the first segment of his index finger twice. Countless illusory thin threads appeared in his eyes, making him see objects that usually couldn't be seen with his normal vision or spirit vision. Two blobs were flying around him, and the dense black bundles of threads that entangled with each other were Rionette Tynecare and the Rose School of Thought's demigod. Apart from these, Klein also discovered that a blob of illusory black threads was rapidly approaching him. It would stop from time to time, so as to avoid the intense battle between the two demigods. There's another enemy, an enemy who is hiding in the distance awaiting the results, but hasn't decided to participate in the battle. Anyways, anyone who's stealthily approaching in such a situation must be an enemy. Klein's eyes moved slightly as he cocked the death knell and lowered it naturally to put it into a state for lethal attack. Then, he pretended as though he hadn't detected the bundle of illusory black threads, stuffed his left palm into his pocket, and grabbed a gold coin. He made it tumble between his fingers as though he was in a divination state. He was doing this to disrupt the approacher's spiritual intuition for danger. After losing his paper figurines, this was the only method he had. After patiently waiting for two seconds, when the other party was within shooting range, Klein's eyes turned solemn as he suddenly raised his right hand, aimed, and pulled the trigger. Chapter 727 Lucky One Thud The black revolver with the slightly long barrel recoiled backward, as a pale golden beam shot out, heading straight for the spot where the target was about to arrive at. However, the illusory black thread suddenly stopped as though they were observing something. From his condition, it didn't appear like he had sensed the arrival of danger, but he had his attention attracted by something else. A grayish-white rabbit leaped out the thick grass and fled far away as the tree standing in front of the blob of illusory black threads collapsed due to the gunshot. At the height of a human, a gigantic and irregular hole, and a raging pure fire appeared at the tree's trunk, directly splitting it from the middle. Death Knell's might was equivalent to a small caliber cannon, and its penetrating powers were even more potent. The blob of dense, illusory black threads was clearly given a fright as it instinctively disappeared from where it was, appearing on the surface of a nearby puddle of water. Inevitably, his figure was outlined. He had a pale face with deep recessed eye sockets and light brown eyes. He looked to be in his forties, had a double mustache above his lips, and wore an old triangular hat. Klein was no stranger to the man, as his bounty notice often appeared before his eyes. Step by step, they were stacked into a clear image, Admiral of Blood Center. Just in loan alone, his bounty was worth 42,000 pounds. He had long infiltrated Bayam. Was it to take away Tyranny von Helmesuen? After this scientist passed away due to being discovered, he joined the Rose School of Thought's mission to target me. 
I seem to have an additional weakness, but before it's triggered, I've no way of knowing what it is. As his thoughts raced, Klein saw Senner's figure disappear once again. However, the traces of Admiral of Blood's existence was rather obvious. The blob of illusory black threads of his was like a firefly in the darkness. It wasn't difficult to identify him at all. The blob of illusory black threads circled around him with the aid of the morning dew, glass fragments, and water puddles that had frozen for some reason. Jumping again and again from one medium to the other, the gap between the two soon narrowed. Klein didn't wait on the spot. Instead, he quickly moved but only slightly shifted his position so as to prevent the Rose School of Thought demigod, who was engaged in an intense battle, from attacking him in passing. Senner's performance made him understand one thing. A wraith's ability to possess someone to directly control their body requires them to enter a certain range. Previously, although the Rose School of Thought demigod was able to accomplish it at further distances, he hadn't done so, perhaps out of contempt or for fear of any accidents. It could be confirmed that Senner was a Sequence 5 Wraith. Klein kept changing his location, and he awaited the opportunity when the distance between them was more suitable. Just as Admiral of Blood's speed slowed down slightly, and he was about to possess his target from a distance, Klein's left glove suddenly turned deep black, as though it was formed layer by layer by pure particles. Following that, he said a word filled with foulness, a word that came from the devil language. Slow. Senner had sensed it and changed his position before Klein could even open his mouth. But everything within an 8 meter radius came to a halt. His evasive maneuver had failed to show any effects. It was an area of effect attack. Senner's figure suddenly became slow. He once again outlined his figure in the real world as Klein raised his iron black revolver, cocked it and placed his target in his sights. With death knell, he saw that Senner's body was covered with all kinds of colors that indicated his weakness wasn't at his head, but slightly above his throat. Without any hesitation or delay, Klein pulled the trigger. Lethal attack. At that moment, a blob of illusory black threads walked to Senner's side and pulled at him. Admiral of Blood immediately moved diagonally as the golden bullet grazed past his neck, striking a boulder and shattering it. A golden flame burst from Senner's neck as it jerked his head up and opened his mouth. A sharp shriek blasted out and entered Klein's ears, causing his mind to hum as his body came to a temporary halt. Formless souls had flown to Senner's side at some point in time before mixing with cold winds. From the sky and from the ground, they surged towards the enemy. In each of Klein's eyes, a pale-looking man with a red coat and triangular hat quickly appeared and took form. Ta, Klein snapped his fingers as his body was instantly enveloped by scarlet flames. He disappeared from his location before the wraith was able to possess him. And under a tree that was less than 10 meters away, weeds burst into flames as the flames grew bigger, and they soared into the sky. Klein nimbly leaped out from it and raised death knell again. He aimed towards the spot where he was originally standing still at, and he injected more than twice the normal amount of spirituality into the gun. Slaughter. Thud. He pulled the trigger as a golden bullet split into countless shrapnel and, with a sacred flame, swept to the region the gun's mouth had aimed at. The formless specters and souls seemed to be swept away by a solar hurricane as they failed to resist and were ignited amidst screaming. Senner knew that a counterattack was in place once his possession attempt didn't succeed. He immediately flashed into a nearby glass fragment in an attempt to evade the incoming shot. But the bullet hurricane brought about by slaughter was a rather huge range that included that glass fragment. Amidst a huge boom, golden flames struck the sides of the glass without hitting it. With only burn injuries, Senner leaped to another mirror surface and appeared on the surface of a rolling drop of dew a distance away. His body had a rotting wound thanks to the purification powers, but it wasn't anything serious. There's no way he's that lucky, right? Indeed, Senner has a mystical item that makes himself lucky. There are only three purifying bullets left. Klein frowned as he agilely ran over as though he was in pursuit. As he knew that he was facing members of the Rose School of Thought, he had changed all the Bayonder bullets in his revolver to purifying bullets that targeted wraiths and zombies. There were a total of six bullets, and now, he had already shot thrice. In the first shot, Senner was saved by a rabbit that suddenly leaped out. In the second shot, he was yanked away by the Rose School of Thought's demigod who happened to come beside him. In the third short, he happened to be in the gap of the fragment amidst the slaughter hurricane, preventing him from suffering too much damage. Klein found this level of luck completely unacceptable. However, Klein didn't wallow in depression. Instead, he turned back into Jamin Sparrow's appearance and build. This was for him to immediately throw a bunch of Sea God Domain charms to create a certain commotion once things went south, so as to attract the attention of Sea King John Cotman who was in Bayam City. If this sequence 3 demigod were to arrive, 
he would be facing a rose school of thought demigod, a hostile pirate admiral, and an adventurer with a mysterious background who had certain ties with the military. It was quite obvious who he would deal with first. As for Miss Messenger, Klein believed that she could escape into the spirit world in a timely fashion and was free to choose whether to participate in the battle royale or leave. The reason why Klein didn't escape in the middle of the night after receiving the telegram last night was because Sea King gave him a sense of security. If he were to leave alone, he would definitely be noticed and captured by the Church of Storms. He would be interrogated, making the subsequent developments unpredictable. If he were to stay in his room and await the person who saw him to attack, he had a chance of struggling until he reached the streets, allowing Sea King to notice it. Faced with an evil operative who was at least a demigod and a Sequence 5 adventurer who was rumored to have ties with the military, there was no doubt that John Cotman would first deal with the Rose School of Thought member. And as a cardinal of the Church of Storms and a high-ranking deacon of the Mandated Punishers, he could use various sealed artifacts of the Doses. He could last a moment, even if he faced an angel. At the same time, with the reinforcements from the military, there was a chance for Klein to escape to the sea during the chaos and leave via whale. To his regret, the night remained peaceful after he received the telegram. And once daybreak happened, Sea King would find it difficult to monitor the entire city. Pa, Klein snapped his fingers again, igniting the surrounding trees. This appeared like blooming fireworks around him as they exuded an inexplicable sense of beauty. The reason why he had chosen to pass through the forest to head for the cliff was because this was a place that was suitable for a magician's performance. His figure flashed through the flames as he circled around center, avoiding his approach and control. And from the previous experiences and lessons, Senner knew that his target had an area of effect attack and a damaging blow. He didn't dare stay too close to him, and he would pull away and create a gap once he missed an attack. Otherwise, he would use a wraith shriek to affect his target or use his pale green fingers to aim at his target. Unfortunately, the latter could only extinguish flames and wither vegetation. There was no way to pinpoint Klein's location. Seeing how the fireworks like flames were the biggest barrier to his attacks, Senner stopped and let out the deafening shriek which would also damage a spirit body. Amidst the shriek, the icy blue halo beneath his feet rapidly expanded, covering the mud, randomly strewn weeds, and scattered rocks with a layer of ice. The flames sizzled as they produced tiny amounts of mist before being extinguished by the frost. Klein was influenced by the wraith's shriek, causing his flaming jump to be one step too slow. He ended up failing, his figure projected itself midway as his feet stumbled. Then, he saw illusory skulls swirling with black gas rush at him, bringing with them the strong smell of death, as though an envoy from the underworld had arrived. At that instant, Klein didn't seem like he could dodge. However, a light blue fireball emanating the smell of sulfur suddenly condensed before him. His glove remained black as it remained in its devil state. With a thumping sound, the fireball was extinguished as the illusory skulls shattered and scattered to the ground, creating spots that didn't have any life to them. Right on the heels of that, Klein steadied his body and took out the iron cigar case from his pocket. He threw it at Admiral of Blood Center as his glove turned noble and sinister at some point in time. Baron of Corruption, Bribe Chapter 728, Triple Combo Center obviously wasn't going to bet that the item thrown by his opponent didn't pose a threat. He immediately dodged far away, allowing the iron cigar case which was sealed by a wall of spirituality to fall to the ground. Then, he opened his mouth once again and produced a shriek. A roar that seemed to come from the depths of his own spirit body made Klein experience excruciating pain in his head. Even though he often suffered from the ravings of existences like the true creator and Mr. Door, and was rather resistant towards such attacks, it was impossible for him to not pause momentarily. He felt his nose burning as though a capillary had burst. However, with his resistance combined together with bribe, the effects were reduced. It made his momentary pause only last for an instant, and this was something Senner had no idea of knowing. Therefore, Klein pretended as though he hadn't recovered as he revealed his weak state, waiting for the enemy to fall into his trap. In an ordinary battle, as a wraith was able to jump through mirror-like mediums, making it impossible to determine that location ahead of time. It made it impossible to maintain a 5-meter distance from his opponent, even if he created flames and repeatedly used it to achieve phasing. It caused his spirit body thread's controlling ability to be disrupted momentarily after there were any significant effects. For this, he planned on taking a little risk. He made his opponent fall for a trap he planned, so as to quickly end the battle and escape to the cliff. Seeing his target appear dazed due to the repeated shrieks, Senner didn't hesitate to make his aura turn deep. Admiral of Blood's contracted figure rapidly appeared in Klein's eyes in an abnormally clear manner. 
this wasn't a reflection of the world, but two tiny figures seemingly coming to life in his eyes. When the wraith's possession was almost close to completion, Klein, with his tattered and charred clothes, unhurriedly extended his left palm as though he was gesturing please as a polite gentleman. Creeping hunger maintained its sinister and noble blackness as it forcefully distorted Admiral of Blood's target. Due to the freezing halo from before, there was frost and crystalline bodies everywhere around them. All of them were equivalent to a mirror surface. On the thin ice, center with his triangular hat had appeared there. His expression was as though he was at a loss. At that moment, creeping hunger switched to a deep black state as Klein said a word filled with foulness, a word that came from the devil language. Slow. Just as he was about to use the mirror surfaces to phase away, center instantly froze. His figure involuntarily outlined itself as his body turned extremely rigid. His attempts had failed. As there was no way to repeatedly use slow, Klein made his left glove turn pale as it was tinged with a slightly dark green color. Zombie, the ceiling caused by the frost on the ground had once again exacerbated as they rapidly spread to center's side as they began to spread from his toes to turn him into a completed ice sculpture. With his knowledge that wraiths had a very strong resistance to the cold, Klein didn't let his guard down or waste any time. He made creeping hunger transform as if it was gilded. The illusory black threads in his eyes were hidden away as two blinding silver bolts of lightning shot out from the innermost depths of his eyes. Interrogator's psychic piercing. In his usual state, Center's fusion of spirit and flesh typically wouldn't be significantly affected. He could even cause the attack to backfire on his opponent. However, having just recovered from slow, he found himself sealed in ice. All he could do was resist the formless bolt that targeted his spirit body. His mind felt as though a blade had penetrated it as it twisted. The pain spread through his body as he temporarily lost all reason. By the time he regained his lucidity and prepared to make continuous leaps to open up a distance, the cold adventurer opposite him opened his mouth once again. Slow, dog's tea. Center's actions turned sluggish and impeded once again. Then, without any surprises, he suffered from the two follow-up attacks of ice stun and psychic piercing. When he barely escaped again, the black-haired, brown-eyed Jamin Sparrow opened his mouth a third time with a deadpan expression. Slow. Center was enraged as he reeled in despair before finding himself stuck in a perpetual cycle. As for Klein, who had kept his opponent in place three times, was beginning to control his opponent's spirit body threads. In fact, the most effective solution for when his opponent was unable to escape was to take the opportunity to use Death Knell to deliver two or three lethal attacks. But his past failures had told him that his enemy had a mystical item that allowed him to be lucky. An overly direct and lethal shot might very well lead to an accident, resulting in some undesirable effects. It was precisely because of this that he decided to gradually proceed in the proper order by controlling Admiral of Blood's spirit body threads. Time quickly passed, as Klein ran around center to dodge the possible attacks from the Rose School of Thought demigod. He controlled Center's spirit body threads, and he slowly reached the state of gaining initial control. Three seconds, two seconds, one second. Center's thoughts instantly turned sluggish as though every part of his body was rusting. Klein no longer had the strength to use creeping hunger again. He continued deepening his control as he began walking at an adequate speed. No, I can't let this continue. Thoughts slowly moved through Center's mind as a translucent icicle condensed in front of him. It was dyed with a gloomy green as though it was showing its respect to the surrounding forest. As for Klein, who had witnessed his opponent's series of slow actions, he unhurriedly retracted his left hand and took out Grossel's travels from his chest and braced himself. Sue, the icicle finally shot out, seemingly heading for Klein's chest, but it suddenly changed directions midway as it flew diagonally upwards. This adjustment should have been a sudden lethal blow, but as Senner's thoughts had been slowed down significantly, the order received by the icicle had only happened when it was almost reaching Klein. This made the sudden change insufficient to catch Klein by surprise as he shifted Grossel's travels and easily blocked the attack. Senner's expression turned pale again. After a few seconds of thought, he slowly opened his mouth in an attempt to let out a wraith's shriek. Having already prepared himself, Klein spoke first. Bang! An air bullet quickly shot out and struck Senner in the mouth, throwing his head backward as teeth fell. The shriek was left stuck in his throat, seeing the control deepen and how Senner's resistance was crumbling bit by bit. To the point of losing his reason and launching a barrage of attacks like a lunatic, Klein suddenly felt some joy. At that moment, a shrill, sharp infant's cry sounded and resounded in the woods. Lumps protruded all over Klein's body as he dropped Grossel's travels from his hand. 
His head felt as though it was being clasped tightly by an invisible hand, making him momentarily lose his senses of his surroundings, including the spirit body threads. His control over center was removed as a result. About a hundred meters away from them, the large-sized baby, which was black, swollen, and wrinkled, that appeared to have stormed out of the water had escaped its illusory state and returned to reality. His limbs were long and thin, and there was only an irregular hole on his face. Circling the hole were gnarling teeth. At that moment, Shank's body had an additional wound that was obvious and deep. It was a piercing wound that went through the black and swollen skin, causing putrid blackish-green liquid to gush out. After this rose school of thoughts demigod appeared, he stopped dodging or escaping. He began screaming like crazy, letting out infantile screams. It made Klein and Senner fall into a painful stupor. Even their bodies showed signs of losing control. The four blonde, red-eyed heads were thrown into the void as they opened their mouths and let out a soundless shriek, silencing the terrifying cries. Rionette Tynecare and Shanks had engaged in another round of combat phasing between the spirit world and reality from time to time as they shuttled between leaves, weeds, insect eggs, ice crystals, and thorns. Senner and Klein stood in their spots in a stupor. They tried their best to recover from the effects of the infantile cry. In this aspect, Senner believed that, as a wraith, he had an unsurpassable advantage. The corners of his lips subconsciously curled up a little. He had already figured out what to do with his opponent later. But at that moment, the eyes of the adventurer who was in tattered clothes while exuding a cold demeanor had turned lucid. It had only been a second since the infantile cry had ended. Klein, who was experienced in this, quickly recovered as he realized that Senner was still in a dazed and impeded state. An opportunity, his mind stirred, but he didn't attempt a long-distance attack which allowed for plenty of accidents. Instead, he chose to control Senner's spirit body threads which took more time. He tapped his right foot as his figure dashed towards his opponent like a panther. His left glove was dark, and when it moved backward, it condensed in a manner that resembled a blade, forming a gigantic weapon formed from lava and flames. Desire Apostle, Sword of Lava. Bam! Klein's body passed by center's left as the searing sword swept across his chest and got stuck in the middle. The light blue flames ignited center, but aside from suffering damage to his body, he didn't lose his life. However, the pain left him yelling incessantly. After the two brushed by each other, Klein immediately abandoned the Sword of Lava. He took a step to his left and turned around, facing Admiral of Blood's back. He raised the Iron Black Death Knell to his opponent's head. He didn't use lethal attack, and he directly pulled the trigger. With a bang, his body suddenly shook a little. This was because the spot he had stepped onto appeared to be a hole. Hence, Death Knell had slid downwards, and the golden bullet had hit the side of Senner's neck. Blood tainted with a dark green tinge spewed out. Admiral of Blood had lost nearly half his neck as he fell forward. He fainted, but he remained alive. Klein was just about to add another shot when the sky suddenly darkened. An arm suddenly reached out. The arm was ten meters long, and it had a black sticky surface with strange protrusions. They were either skulls, erected eyeballs, or barbed tongues. The moment it appeared, it made the entire forest shake. All the leaves withered as all the insects stiffened to their deaths. All the beasts either fell paralyzed to the ground, or they began biting themselves wildly, leaving their bodies bleeding. Klein's danger premonition reached its limit. He hurriedly closed his eyes, lunged forward, and did a roll. He grabbed Grossel's travels and held it in front of his face. Chapter 729, Chaos The entire forest was withering as though an entity that was bringing about destruction to everything was about to descend. Just as the arm was about to fully extend, a thick bolt of silver lightning smote down from nowhere, illuminating the entire mountain. The sizzling sounds chained together as a cage only spoken in myths and closed around the black sticky arm. Dark clouds quickly converged together in the sky, forming brows and a mouth, as though a face was hidden within. In Bayam City, the huge commotion was noticed by Sea King John Cotman. He didn't hesitate to take action as he ordered the mandated punishers to activate the corresponding sealed artifacts. Rionette Tynecare's figure was forced out of the void, but her complicated black dress didn't seem crumpled at all. She raised her left hand as two of the blonde, red-eyed heads flew back and landed on her severed neck. The remaining two continued engaging in combat with the black, swollen, and wrinkled infant. When the cut at her neck began to wriggle, two corresponding cuts were connected. Her figure instantly burgeoned to the size of a gothic castle. Patterns, vines, and accessories appeared on the surface, interweaving into a mysterious, sinister sight that couldn't be looked at. Klein closed his eyes tight as he placed Grossel's travels in front of his face, injecting his spirituality into it. But he was unable to eliminate all the effects inflicted upon him. 
His body kept quivering as granules kept protruding from his body, and only at this moment did he confirm that the side effect of using death knell was a fear of the dark. For the next six hours, he wouldn't suffer any more weaknesses. Thankfully, the weakness is just insurmountable, but it doesn't mean that I'm unable to resist for a short period of time. Klein desperately closed his eyes as tears kept rolling down his cheeks. He didn't spend time considering the problems regarding this, because the situation had developed into one of extreme danger, but it was also very chaotic. The one that descended seems to be stronger than Sea King. It's likely an angel, but his condition doesn't seem to be particularly good as well. He didn't directly appear, and he instead used the spirit world to attack. Is it because he can't rush here in time and could only consider using this method? Thankfully, I received a warning from Orange Light, otherwise, the results would be unthinkable if this situation drags on. As Klein's thoughts flashed through his mind, his first reaction was to take the opportunity to flee and open up a safe distance. However, he knew that hastily retreating without any preparations was equally dangerous. If the Rose School of Thought's angel abandons the attack and retracts his arm, Sea King John Cotman wouldn't have any motivation in embroiling himself in a pursuit effort. This is because he isn't facing a saint who he can consider retaining. This way, simply relying on Miss Messenger, Rionet Tynecare, makes it difficult to stop this entity. I might be pursued again when the time comes. I have to add more trouble for him, making him temporarily unable to leave. I'll take this opportunity to escape the waters where Blue Mountain Island is. As his thoughts churned, Klein followed his emergency plans, took out Grossell's travels, stuffed Death Knell inside, and made a few rolls before arriving next to the iron cigar case. He stabbed it with his finger, removing the wall of spirituality and opening the case, and he threw tinder, which was corrupted by the true creator, into the air, towards the source of the danger. Right on the heels of that, Klein used Grossell's travels to shield the top of his head, opened his eyes, and took out a whistle. This wasn't Azix's copper whistle, but the numinous episcopate copper whistle which he had obtained from a mysticism enthusiast in Backlund. It originated from a resurrected Numinous Episcopate member. Back then, Klein had made a divination about the copper whistle, and he received a revelation that sending a message would be extremely dangerous. At that moment, he decided to allow extreme danger to meet extreme danger, so as to create an even more chaotic situation that benefited him. He quickly put the copper whistle to his mouth and blew into it. Then, he activated his spirit vision without daring to look up. A skull with three lifeless eyes emerged. Around it were black appendage-like tentacles. Without any hesitation, Klein handed over a white feather left behind by the resurrected Numinous Episcopate member to the messenger. He didn't wait for the messenger to disappear as he immediately bulged his muscles, swung his arm, and threw the copper whistle into the air, where the source of danger was. With that done, he put away the iron cigar case, did another roll, and bounced up as he rushed straight for the cliff. During this process, he kept his head down and kept changing location. He didn't dare to look at the scene happening above him, nor did he dare to stay any longer. When he passed by the spot where Admiral of Blood Center should have been lying unconscious, Klein's gaze suddenly froze. He was alarmed to find that he had vanished. In that chaotic situation without any aid, this wraith, who had suffered immense damage and was unable to maintain his spirit body state, had vanished. Klein paused as he swept his gaze. He saw that ahead of him were a few drops of splattered dark red blood that coruscated with a dark green tint. And this region was where Grossell's travels had previously dropped. No way. A few drops of Admiral of Blood's blood dropped onto the book's cover. This sucked him in. Klein frowned, as he didn't think it was a good thing. He was afraid that the angel and saint that the Mother Tree of Desire had sent was able to gain the help of Admiral of Blood from within Grossell's travels to pursue him. However, it was impossible for him to abandon the book. Without it, Klein didn't believe that he was lucky enough to dodge all the stray blasts, an unknown shrapnel which could fall from the sky at any moment. I'll resolve this latent risk by entering with my spirit body after I escape. As a few thoughts rose up in his mind, Klein dipped the tip of his foot down as he ran, lifting up the soil which had Senner's blood on it, reached out, and grabbed a handful. This was used to locate Admiral of Blood later. Tap, tap, tap. Klein ran in a meandering manner, holding Grossell's travels over his head, making adjustments from time to time based on his premonition for danger. The book blocked the random bolts of lightning or the scattering rain of corroding rock, and it shielded him from a terrifying gaze that was cast over. With the book, Klein successfully tore out of the lifeless forest and came to the edge of a cliff. At this moment, the surroundings turned dark. It wasn't the kind of darkness before a storm, nor was it a result of a moonless or starless night. It was a dead silence that emanated the smell of rot. 
raving sounded out from varying distances and at varying pitches, as though something seemed to be slowly breathing in the air. Klein, who was afraid of the dark, trembled. He didn't dare to look at what was happening above him. All he noticed was a few white feathers stained with yellowish oil spiraling down to the ground nearby when there was a flash of lightning. His right foot took a stride forward as he jumped off the cliff and plummeted straight down. He fell out of the darkness and could see light. Then, he dropped into a mouth that had been waiting for him for a long time. The mouth didn't have any teeth as it immediately closed and sank to the bottom of the sea. According to the agreement they had made previously, it was to head for a reef beyond Blue Mountain Island as quickly as possible. This was a gigantic undersea creature with 16 fins on its back. In the darkness, Klein instinctively wished to huddle into a ball and helplessly tremble. But he barely repressed his emotions and took out a priest of light beyonder characteristic he had prepared to deal with wraiths. He had obtained it through the glove. Pure light emanated from the translucent stone-like object as it drove away Klein's fear. He was just about to contemplate if he should wait for the outcome or if he should attempt something. When he suddenly felt the back of his palm become itchy, he hurriedly looked down and saw his pores widen as they grew some fine white hair. These fine hair rapidly grew and looked like feathers. Klein immediately felt his entire body itch. The fellow that was attracted by the copper whistle is really very dangerous. Klein was rather experienced. He immediately stood up and took four steps counterclockwise while chanting the incantation in the undersea creature's mouth. His spirit body once again tore through the grayish white which had endless ravings and roars as blackish green gases drilled out of his body. Returning to the palace that looked like a giant's residence, Klein observed his spirit body once again, and he discovered that it had returned to normal. There weren't any of the blackish green gases, nor were there any white feathers. Phew, it's effective. He exhaled and immediately returned to the real world. With the illumination from the Priest of Light Beyonder characteristic, Klein saw that the white feathers on the back of his hands remained, but they had lost the ability to continue growing. There were more or less some signs in other parts of his body, but they weren't obvious. Yes, I should be able to resolve the remaining problems once Mr. Azik arrives. Klein heaved a sigh of relief and drew the crimson moon on his chest. He prayed for the goddess's blessing, and that Mr. Azik would arrive quickly. At this moment, Rionette Tynecare's figure appeared before him. This messenger had three heads growing on her head while she held one in her hand. Compared to before, she appeared more lively. She reached out with her left palm and grabbed Klein's shoulder, and she directly brought him into the spirit world as they quickly traveled through it. Amidst brightly stacked colors, Klein felt somewhat dizzy before he returned to reality and realized that he was on a reef. Rionette Tynker's forehead swept the area and said, Already. Safe. Remember. To pay. Next time. With that said, she vanished as though she had something more important to do. You could do that. I should have just gotten Miss Messenger to bring me away using such a method. However, her present state doesn't seem to be that great either. This must be a state and method she seldom uses. As Klein reflected over the matter, he placed the Priest of Light Beyonder characteristic into his pocket, and he kept Grossel's travels outside. Just as he was about to size up his surroundings to figure out where he was, another arm reached out and grabbed his shoulder. Klein jumped in fright as he hurriedly turned his head, only to discover that Mr. Azik had arrived. Azik grabbed his shoulder and pulled him into the spirit world once again. They rapidly moved through the brightly stacked colors. Actually, I'm already safe. The corners of Klein's mouth twitched, but he didn't say those words. 